Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Jacoby Symphony Hall. I'm Tony Nickel, the Director of Artistic Administration here. And uh, we have a very interesting and exciting program, and I'm joined tonight by uh, some really exciting guests. Um, of course, con conducting tonight's uh, concert will be Maestro Nathan Aspinall, our Associate Conductor. <laughs> also joining us to uh, help us discuss uh, Masorchki's pictures at an exhibition is Lindsay Boyer from MOCA Jacksonville. And you may uh, have heard of the, the mildly successful organist Cameron Carpenter. Yeah. It's great to have everyone here. And um, it, it's a really interesting program that uh, doesn't, on paper, maybe share a, a, a very evident link in terms of you know, the nationalities of the composers or even the periods in which they're composed, but the sound world of the entire concert really does share some commonality. Uh, the, the, the program really did begin with uh, the interest in bringing Cameron to Jacksonville. Um, that was really what guided our hand through the, the whole thing, and um, uh, obviously because he's, he's an incredible artist. But um, what, what, the, what got programmed around it was a, a sound world that really does mimic the organ in a sense. I mean, it's just filled with power and uh, an immense palette of color. Um, so it, it's a, gonna be a really blow your hair back kind of evening tonight. So get ready for that. Um, I would like to uh, also mention that we have uh, the show again here tomorrow night and then on Monday, we're very excited to be taking the entire program, the entire orchestra and Cameron, uh, down to the Kravis Center in West Palm Beach, which is a wonderful hall. Um, and, and they have a replica of Cameron's touring uh, instrument there as well, which you dedicated about two and a half years ago at a concert that we, that we performed on. So um, and we're really excited to be going down there too. So I'd like to... Uh, begin by talking about the Wagner that kicks this program off. Um, the, it's it's uh, the overture and the Venusberg music from his opera Tannhäuser. And I'd like to, Nathan, ask you to um, just talk us through these two uh, 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 excerpts that are through composed together in the way that we're performing them. Well, the, uh, the opera is about a man called Tannhäuser, and he is torn between two women. Uh, Elizabeth is from the normal, real, earthly world, and Venus is from the underworld. And throughout the opera, he is torn between which one he, you know, finds true love with. And what we're performing tonight is the Overture and Venusberg music. And so in the excerpts we're performing, you get an image of both worlds. You get the, the very noble, stately, somewhat religious world of Earth, and then you get the indulgent, rhapsodic uh, world of, of Venus. And it's a wonderful way to introduce people to the opera because at the end of it, we, we, we ask ourselves, you know, you know, how do we balance those two aspects? in our lives and it, no one wins. You have, you're presented with both worlds and then you make up your, your own mind. So this is Tannhäuser in 25 minutes. And, and the opera begins after the overture with Tannhäuser in Venusberg, which is essentially sort of a, a Bacchanalian uh, pr uh, profane love world. Um, and uh, so how, what, what how, how does the music, sort of, it, how is it juxtaposed, this idea of a very uh, sort of lustful, wild love versus maybe more sacred sound? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's in, if, if you look at all the musical elements, each of them describe these two worlds. So the harmony of the overture is much more diatonic. It's the, the structure is clearer. The opening sounds like a kind of hymn or a chorale, and you, you get the sense of nobility and, and normality that's the right word. And then the Venus music is completely rhapsodic, indulgent. There's lots of rubato. It's noisy. It's loud. It's angular. The phrases are, uh, are, are not clear. So, so Wagner very brilliantly, you know, depicts these two 
very distinct worlds. And you'll, w one note in the program is that we're performing the Paris version. Um, it, it is kind of interesting. This is a piece that Wagner, of all the things that he composed, especially from uh, the Flying Dutchman on, which sort of are his, the body of work that he's really known for. Um, Tannhäuser is the one that he was least happy with. He even went uh, on his deathbed, he made a comment to his wife Cosima about how unsatisfied he was with uh, the, the work. Uh, he didn't feel like it was totally complete. But um, the Paris version is a revision and, and just sum up for us what is different about the Paris version versus the original. Well, what's special about the performance is often the overture to Tannhäuser is performed um, in concert, but not so often with the Venusberg music. So Wagner wrote uh, the first version of Tannhäuser in 1845 for performances in Dresden, and that is the version when you just hear the overture, that's the version that, um, that comes from that uh, opera. Then in 1861, for a performance in Paris, he revised it, and the big thing about the opera in, palace, in Paris is that it has a fabulous ballet, so all the operas needed to have a ballet sequence, and quite controversially, Wagner decided to have the ballet as the very opening scene. And so the overture f merges into the ballet, which is the Venusberg music, so when we get to that part in Paris, that would have been completely, you know, you know with wild choreography, um, uh, so, so what he does is he, ch he takes just a normal overture and links it into the first scene, which would have been a really extravagant ballet in Paris. So following the Wagner, we move to, uh, a, we jump to the 20th century, to the 1930s in France, uh, Francis Poulenc's uh, organ concerto. And uh, while it does really harness tremendous power from the organ, it is a it's, it's powerful, but it has a much more uh, uh, tasteful or Baroque texture to it than uh, the Wagner does. So, uh, Cameron, can you tell us a little bit about um, the, 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 some interesting notes about the piece and also just sort of the, the ways in which Poulenc is kind of looking backward in, in uh, the structure of the piece? Um, well, I suppose uh, if there's a Baroque influence, it's that the, the essence of the Baroque, of course, is contrast. And there's um, a great, what, one of the great things about this piece, and um, an easy thing to take away from it, even if you're not particularly musically minded, is its enormous vulnerability. Um, and that's, that's one of the great... Um, you know, turns of wit that Poulenc pulls off in this because um, the, the organ, well, we know, I suppose, that what the organ is thought of or should know that, that how the organ is thought of and, and, and resolutely to this day is um, generally uh, stereotypical at best. Um, and the idea of the organ as somehow symbolic of eternity um, comes, seems to come from the church, but actually comes from the physics of the instrument itself, which, of course, uses energy, a source of energy from outside the human body to produce sound. And so, unlike the instruments of the orchestra, and in fact, unlike all of the other energetic uh, realities that sort of musical instruments, and in fact, the human voice symbolize about humanity, the organ stands outside of that and in, in some way stands outside of time. And so it tends to have this invincibility to it um, in its stereotypical image, which is um, wonderfully dismissed by Poulenc in a couple of ways, in the, in, the, in the continual shift of color and also of character, but as I said, in the vulnerability and personally, and it's a personal reading, but one can't help that, I suppose, it seems to me the enormous sarcasm and irony of this music, um, which is also a sort of um, a sort of queering, I suppose you might say, of the normal role of the organ, or at least of the Christian role of the organ, which is you know either it somehow symbolizes eternity or the, the the word of God, but in some way is unshakable. The very changeability of the t of of the of the essence of the piece. Um, not only melodically and in terms of sound and dynamics, 
but in, in more abstract ways, such as the actual mood of the music or what the mood seems to be, um, is it distinctly human. It's very much of the human experience and not of God, and not of the beyond, at least. That's a somewhat secular reading of the, yeah. So uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about, um, one thing that is, is fascinating to me as I sat through rehearsals this week is hearing the uh, evolution of the way that you choose uh, what voicings to bring out in the organ, which um, is related to the way that you register it. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the choices that you as a soloist have and what you can do with the instrument that is not necessarily written on the page or you may be sort of uh, extracting from the score. Uh, well, I'm a bad uh, example uh, in many ways as an organist um, in this, in that I've always um, stood fairly obstinately outside the realm of, and it's a closely guarded realm, as you might imagine, of um, the met methodologies of organ registration, particularly when they come from France. Um, the highest organ writing that there is, which occurs in the music of J.S. Bach, of course, um, I think at two points in the music of Bach do we have indications where he gives us non-musical information about what's to be done with the organ. Um, and in those cases, it's extremely, it's extremely sparing. In fact, Bach's organ music is remarkable partly in that he doesn't even really provide phrasing information for the most part. Well, he doesn't have to really because it's usually pretty self-evident. Self, uh, self but um, you could can contrast that then with the, the middle of the 19th century when you uh, get to, say, César Franck's music, um, in which he was writing for an organ in, at saint Clotilde in Paris at the time, which was probably the most technologically advanced organ in the world, um, and made what in some ways is kind of a, kind of a, a cat catastrophic error, although it, he couldn't have done otherwise in the evolution of music, which was to um, contrabas, um, you know, explicitly specify exactly what, he, what was to be done on that organ. The problem with that, of course, is that um, organists, being no strangers to the world of dogma, um, th over the years and the, the decades and ultimately the centuries, and also as these figures of classical music tend, as they seem to do, to ascend to godlike status, you get, uh, the, you, you, you get the problem of these uh, indications which have to do with music, but which are less than the notes. Um, that's not to say they're non-musical, but they're supplementary to the musical information. Um, they would have no meaning without the, the, the higher order of information that they're, that they're modifying or attempting to, to give us information about, that you end up with that becoming, that information becoming holy grail and gospel. Um, it seems to me that that, uh, and has always seemed to me that um, partly by dint of the way that the organ works, the selection of the colors which are used at any given musical moment are as much an illustration of musical personality on the part of the performer, itself a controversial role, uh, uh, issue I know uh, in our ridiculous postmodern world. Um, but those selections are just as much of an indication about, about the performers, in, in other words, they're just as much of a venue for interpretation, vehicle for interpretation, as the playing of the notes themselves. And um, therefore, I basically always um, sort of throw myself on the mercy of the methodology of Bach, which is that if the music um, is properly constructed, it will be able to support a variety of, um, of art registration approaches. In the case of this organ, um, this is an organ I know from years ago, um, but not at all well. And so the, the evolution that you described actually is, is rather just a, a sort of a received and a, a very kindly described one, I might add, um, impression of my attempting to fumble for control of an instrument. Um, but that being said, a certain spontaneity in the approach, I think, is not only natural to me as a performer, but um, 
has more to do with the idea of the music being created live here tonight for us, experienced by us. Um, the, the idea of the piece and the ideas of, uh, you know, the, the things that I might do at Kravis, where, for instance, I designed the organ, um, will not influence this performance basically at all. And there are absolutely things in the performance, by the way, Nathan, you might as well know, that will probably be decided in the moment. Um, and that spontaneity is a right that I reserve, so you don't have to deal with it. Well, we're very much looking forward to it. It's a, it's a thrilling piece. Um, so I'd like to turn now to uh, the second half of the program, which is Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition, which was originally written, a piece written for the piano, and was then later orchestrated by Maurice Ravel, who by many accounts, other than maybe Rossini as a close second, is the greatest orchestrator uh, probably in history. And um, uh, the piece uh, is really a musical depiction of Mussorgsky's uh, uh, impression of a very dear friend of his, uh, Victor Hartman's artworks that were displayed after Hartman suddenly passed away. I think he was only 39 or 40 years old and um, uh, I'd like to turn uh, the rest of this over to Lindsay and Nathan. Um, Lindsay, would you begin by walking us through uh, who Victor Hartman was, maybe their connection, and talk a little bit about the, the artworks from this exhibition that still survive today that we have displayed here along the front of the stage. So uh, both Mussorgsky and Hartman were part of the Russian revivalist movement. Both came from very well-to-do, well-connected families, both highly educated. Uh, and this particular period in Russian history is fascinating to me because they started producing their work and meeting other like-minded artists at a time when a lot of aristocrats were more likely to speak more French and German in some cases than Russian. Um, so the Russian revivalist movement became dedicated to uh, a renewal of Russian handicrafts, of Slavic architecture, everything that these men saw as quintessentially Russian, they devoted themselves to. And that was how they came to know each other. They were part of a group called the Balakriev. I'm probably messing that up. I hope no one's Russian, my apologies. Uh, a group of artists that contained Mussorgsky, several other well-known Russian composers. The writer Gogol was part of this group. And it was after several years abroad where he spent a lot of time sketching and doing watercolors that Hartman came back and really threw himself into a very Russian style that he met Mussorgsky and the sort of leader of this little group, a man named Vladimir Stasso. But this exhibition originally had a roughly 400 works. It was massive because Vladimir Stasso, who was such a huge fan and admirer of Hartman's style, literally collected everything he could lay his hands on that Hartman had ever made. So he was extremely prolific. In addition to architecture, he did set design, he did costume design, uh, jewelry design, sketching and watercolor. He also did wood graving illustrations for uh, published books. So of those original 400 pieces, there's roughly only 60 that still exist, which as somebody who works with artwork, I think one of the saddest phrases in the English language is lost artwork. Um, and some of the pieces that survive are part of private collections now, and this exposition was the first time that all of his work had been collated and displayed. And Mussorgsky was very close to him and wrote very, very heartfelt letters to Vladimir Stasso and Stasso's wife, uh, lamenting man's ignorance and uh, denial of death and using phrases like why should a horse or a rat live but someone as magnificent as Hartman has to die so young because he did die very suddenly of an aneurysm. Um, so some of these pieces that we have, the first one over to the side is the Ballet of the Chicks in their shells. That's some of Hartman's costume design work. He did 17 for this ballet, it was called Trilby. It was loosely based off a French story by an author named Charles Nodier and the choreographer Petipa made some changes to the overall plot. He changed the location of the story from Scotland to Switzerland. 
but the overall arc of the plot was a tragic love story of uh, an elf or house spirit that falls in love with a mortal woman and can't be with her. And this piece I found kind of amusing because it's very hard to imagine anyone being able to dance in a shell made like armor like that. This was supposed to be for little children uh, in the Russian ballet. Uh, the Russian ballet company in Trilby was first performed by the Bolshoi uh, State Ballet as well. If you, if you care to talk about it musically. No, maybe. Lindsay's doing very well. She knows much more about it than me. I think <laughs> she should conduct the concert. <laughs> Um, I mean, what's interesting to me is how uh, Mazolski took these pictures and humanized them. You know, he makes the pictures really come alive. And they're not just characters, but they're characters with personality. The, the first movement after the promenade is about a gnome. And it has these very angular, aggressive, clunky um, noises coming from the low instruments. And you get, instantly get a picture that this is, you know, not someone who's particularly healthy. But then the second theme is like this kind of heaving, um, sorrowful uh, motif. And suddenly you kind of feel empathy for him. It's, he's not just a kind of caricature. You feel sorry for him. You, you, you can feel him crying, feel him whining. So, I mean, what I really enjoy is looking at these pictures, but then trying to find the story behind them, trying to make the, um, the characters come alive, and, and Mazorsky has done this in such an original, inventive, colourful way. There's no other piece in the repertoire that is kind of quite as bold or um, as daring. One thing I would like to draw your attention to is the movements at the beginning seem quite frivolous and simple. There's a whole sequence where they go very fast and they're very short. Most of them are only one or two minutes. But towards the end, there are three movements that all depict death in some way. There are three different pictures of death. Um, and the, the last one, Baba Yaga, is this very frightening portrait of a, of a um, woman who chases children and crushes their bones with um, her mortar, which is you know, a very lovely image to have on a Friday, Friday night. But if you realise that these are very dark pictures, then the Great Gate of Kiev, which is the most radiant, exciting, uplifting um, music there is, is much more meaningful. So the piece, I think, is an homage to Hartman, and it's a piece about life and death. It's, it's life in all its joys and frivolities, and, and also at its very darkest moments. But it's, the message of the piece is ultimately uplifting, and um, if we do it well, it should be a very joyous night in the concert hall. Maybe we'll go to discuss the rest of our work. Sure. Uh, yes, life and death plays a huge huge role in both how Mussorgsky approached producing this piece and the overall theme. In his surviving letters and notes in the music, you get a sense that he was a little bit manic getting this music down to paper. He uses metaphors about feeling like it's bubbling over and bubbling out of him or uh, the image that he's like gorging himself on food. He just can't seem to get it down fast enough. Uh, one of his notes on the catacombs piece over here to my left, I like to imagine that because it was right after his good friend's death that he chose it specifically. And in his notes on the music, he wrote that he felt like the spirit of Hartman was, was pulling him to this because it is a portrait of the artist um, that he did during his time in France, which he spent several years in as kind of like a postgraduate education. And he felt like his spirit was pulling him to it and that piece really resonated with him. Uh, I really like the piece, uh, Baba Yaga. It has a really fascinating anecdote behind it about Hartman's personality who, based on notes from people who observed him and people who were close to him, also had a kind of uh, manic creative energy about him. People who observed him said that the idea that he could sit and play cards during the night or just sit and be still, they said it would probably kill him. He just couldn't stand it. He was always creating. He was always thinking about the next thing he wanted to create. And there's a great anecdote about him being at an artist ball where there's all these distinguished guests and they are all dressed in very Western European styles. They're dressed like Spaniards and Turks and Italian abbots and decks of playing cards, which was very fashionable. and. Uh, the observer, I think it might have been Stasso himself, notes that uh, Hartman showed up to this party dressed as Baba Yaga. 
and had a wig with long braids and a mask with tusks coming out and a false beard stuck to his chin. And I love that image so much. And I like to think that if Mussorgsky wasn't at that party, he probably knew that story and that that could have led to his decision to include the Hat of Baba Yaga in the piece. Um, she's part of an old Russian Slavic uh, legend and her house supposedly had chicken legs and would get up and walk around. Uh, and Stasso writes that that's always the way it was with Hartman, that no matter what, he was finding a way to kind of push the envelope and get people's attention, maybe even rile them up a little bit. Uh, this piece over here is called the, the Two Jews. It originally had a Yiddish title. Uh, Hartman spent about a month in Poland. He had a Polish wife, and that was where he did a lot of his genre studies of everyday people. This is one of the only pieces that Mussorgsky had in his personal collection that was just his. There has been debate over years that it was a separate piece that uh, no one really knows where it is right now that was pencil drawings, but just based on Stasso's program that he wrote for the, uh, for the exhibition. Sometimes scholars go back and forth as to whether or not this image is what he wrote it about because it's the only movement in the whole thing that he did not title. Um, and then the Great Gate of Kiev on the back, as Nathan mentioned musically, is really significant in the piece and very grandiose. And that's an echo of what Hartman wanted to accomplish with this style. Architecturally, he was less concerned with solving problems of architecture and adaptation of structure so much as ornamentation, which was very, very typical for uh, the Slavophile and Russian revivalist movement. A lot of decoration for decoration's sake. Um, the sort of peaked dome on the end is styled after a Slavic war helmet. There's very traditional motifs based on ropes, embroideries, incorporating roosters. And he intentionally sunk the monument with the columns about three quarters of the way into the ground uh, so that it would feel like it had been there for a very, very long time. And that gate was dedicated or meant to be dedicated as a commemoration of uh, the Tsar, uh, excuse me, the emperor escaping assassination. But they just said to commemorate the events of April 18, I forget the year, because uh, there was still a lot of censoring going on. Uh, but he considered it his finest work, and he had designed that piece for a competition uh, for a government monument, and unfortunately the competition was called off and the piece was never built. The only surviving architectural piece of his right now is in the artist colony, uh, which was actually where he died, the Abremsto uh, artist colony, and you can actually still tour it to this day. It is an existing museum, but you do see a lot of uh, very traditional and medieval Slavic architecture, not unlike what you see in the portrayal of Baba Yaga's hut with the peaked roof and the beams that sort of cross right over the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna let uh, our artists get ready for the concert tonight. Um, thank you again, Nathan. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Cameron, for everything tonight. And um, I, I hope you enjoy our great concert. Thank you all for being here for uh, this uh, discussion. Also, thank you to everyone watching online uh, this evening and um, enjoy the concert. <laughs>